And now we will be walking through the third chapter of Corinthians and verses 12 through 14. And the Apostle Paul writes, Put on then as God's chosen one, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Dear friends, there is a garment that the worldly man puts on, and the garment that that worldly man puts on is that of his own making, that of his own creation. He has a standard of law whereby he has diminished the perfect and holy law of God. He has made it out to be something that is attainable for him, something that he can sufficiently meet, or in the times in which he does not quite meet this diminished version of the law that he has created, it is something that there is legitimate excuse for the reasons in which he does not meet this standard that he has created in and of himself. After all, he's human. Nobody's perfect after all. And at least he didn't do this or do that. And these are the works of his hands that he is clothing himself in. Now, dear friends, there is a garment that the Christian puts on. It is quite different than that of the worldly man. You see, the garment of the worldly man is like that which Adam and Eve put on themselves. See, back in the garden, as you remember, Adam and Eve had sinned against the Lord. They were told not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They disobeyed God's command. They thought they knew what was best. They had created for themselves a different version of the law of God. They had joined an alliance with Satan against the Lord. They thought they could be just like God in creating law, in determining what was right and what was wrong. Oh, the shame they fell under. The shame they fell under immediately when they had first sinned, and they realized the reality of this shame, and so they sought to cover themselves, sought to cover themselves in what you would find to be an incredibly foolish way, went out and gathered fig leaves for themselves, covered themselves in that way. This was their work of righteousness that they had made because they had sinned in the presence of the Lord. And so it is with the works of man. They take that which they have created, they take their own efforts, and they seek to cover themselves. But oh, the ways in which it was insufficient. Oh, the ignorance that is there. Imagine the foolishness of covering yourself with that which is mere leaves. Oh, but days would go by, weeks would go by, it would begin to decompose. It seemed so wise for Adam and Eve at the moment. It seemed like such a wise course of action. But they saw not the frailty of what they embarked upon. It was ignorant. They felt secure at the moment in their actions. But there was no lasting value to what they had done. Their shame would soon be revealed as the days went by. Oh, but God... But God provided for them, did he not? God granted to them, though it may have been symbolic in many ways, it pointed forward to that greater covering that the Lord would provide for all of his people. The Lord struck down an animal, made clothing for Adam and Eve, and they clothed themselves in it a more appropriate garment, one that would last more than just a few days, one that would not just immediately decompose as the days went by. Think about it. As soon as they began to pull those pig, fig leaves off of the tree, they began to die. They began to decompose. 
But the Lord provided a covering for them. And it pointed forward to this ultimate covering that the Lord would grant to his people, which is the clothing and the righteousness of Christ, that which they can clothe themselves in, that which will cover their shame, that which will cover the consequences of their sins. And it is from that that all of their righteous deeds going forward should be based upon. That should be the driving force in their lives that desires them to walk into further and further obedience. In the times when the Christian realizes the ways in which they fall short, the times in which you come to a greater understanding of what God has required of you and the ways in which you fall short of that which the Lord has required of you merely means it's greater and greater that you need to cling to the cross more and more that you need to clothe yourself in the righteousness of Christ Jesus and so the Lord has granted to the Christian those who have put on the righteousness of Christ those who are clothed in Christ's righteousness are to put on this gospel apparel so there's a little bit of a theme here. Those of you that are involved in sewing or making clothes, you may appreciate the theme within this, but we have this theme of gospel apparel. We have the recipients of gospel apparel. These that the Lord has chosen, these that the Lord has called out of darkness, these that were running about naked in their own fig leaves that were of no use that did not actually cover their shame, did not actually deal with their unrighteousness, is these that are the recipients of this gospel apparel, that which the Lord has so determined that they would clothe themselves in, that they would walk in because they have been granted grace through faith in the risen Lord Christ Jesus. Secondly, we have the fabric of this gospel apparel, that which... This gospel apparel is comprised of that which the Lord desires for you to put on. You have taken off. You have taken off your works of unrighteousness. You have taken off your works of pseudo-righteousness. You have put on Christ's righteousness. And so there is a uniform for you, dear Christian. There is a way in which you are to conduct yourself. There is a way in which you are to Clothe yourself. There are marks that should exist within your life. Thirdly, we see the ramifications of gospel apparel. The ramifications of gospel apparel. There are effects that this gospel apparel will have upon you and your life and the lives of those that you interact with. And fourthly, we see the thread that binds this gospel apparel, that which harmonizes all of these fabrics there that you are to clothe yourself in, that you are to be putting on because you have put on Christ's righteousness. Let's look first here. Point one, the recipients of gospel apparel. Verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Look what Paul says there. I want you to notice the many times that Paul will make an emphasis like this. He does it in all of his letters. He never just gives a bunch of commands. He always reminds the people why it is they are to walk in this way, that they would continue to see their need of Christ, that they would continue to see the manifest ways that they need to be trusting in Christ, that their obedience would not be something that they are trusting in for their justification, but rather something that they do, that they have a drive toward because they are justified, because they have been saved, put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved Think of that, friends. It's so easy just to read past that, just to go on to all of these attributes that we really like. 
He's encouraging the Christian to have this as their driving force in what you do. You are beloved. You are holy. You are one of God's chosen ones. You are God's chosen people. Let that soak in. Just stay there for a moment. You are one of God's chosen people. The one who owed you absolutely nothing has called you out of darkness. Paul here is encouraging Christians to remember what they are. And this is a far, far cry from moralism. He's not telling the Corinthians here, look guys, you just need to do better. You can do better. You can do this. He's not telling them they just need to try harder. He's not telling them, look, you just, you've got everything you need. You've always had everything you need in you. Jesus is just helping you out. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. No. He is reminding them of what they are. They are holy and beloved. They are God's chosen people. Let's the camp there for a second. I want us to reflect upon this in light of what we know to be true in Scripture. Dear friend, if you are in Christ, if the grace of God has been lavished upon you, if you have been called, you have been justified, you have been sanctified, and you are one who will be glorified, it's not because God saw something special about you. It's not because God was looking through the corridors of time and determining who would be good, who would be obedient, who would rightly, rightly benefit from his grace. No. It's not because he found anything good in you. No. You're God's, cho holy, God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. God's chosen ones. God's sovereign choice. There's a history of this. We, we don't merely need to look at what Paul's writing here in Colossians. Of course, we could find many other passages in the New Testament. We could remember even what Moses says to the Jews in the Old Testament back in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 7. He says this, the Lord did not set his heart on you and choose you because you were more numerous than any other nation. For you were the smallest of the nations. He says that with emphasis. Rather, it was simply that the Lord loves you. And he was keeping the oath that he had sworn to your ancestors. That is why the Lord rescued you with such a strong hand from your slavery and from the oppressive hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commandments. But he does not hesitate to punish and destroy those who reject him. Therefore, you must obey all these commands, decrees, and regulations that I am giving you today. Well, what was the reason that the Lord chose the Jews as his chosen people whereby the Messiah was going to come forward? Not because of their numbers. Not because of their strength. Not because of their military might. He demonstrated that. He merely walking around cities and defeating them. Not because of their wisdom. Not because of their might. Oh, but wait. Perhaps the Lord looked down the corridors of time and he saw all the ways in which the Jewish people were going to glorify him. All the ways in which they were going to be obedient to him and, and shine the light of his name throughout the world. Probably not true, now is it? Was it not this people that were saved out of the clutches of Pharaoh merely to walk into the wilderness and violate the second commandment and worship the God that saved them out of the hand of Pharaoh in the same way in which they would have worshipped one of the false gods in Egypt? All the ways in which they lacked patience, 
this group that would deny God as their king shortly after getting into the land, this people that would begin to demand to have a king just like all the other nations. Why can't we be like those that are around us? But the Lord was patient. The Lord did not break his oath that he had made. This people that would then go in, remove the Canaanites, fulfill God's plan in that area, bring in the judgment of God upon this people because of the greatness of their sin, incredible ways, terrible sin that was occurring in that land at that time. And then God's chosen people would go into the land and out the Canaanites that they had removed, sinning in ways that would have made the Canaanites blush, sinning in ways in which the Canaanites were not participating in. In all honesty, sinning in some of the greatest activities that have ever occurred. And in case you think I'm exaggerating, you need to play, pay close attention when you're reading through the Old Testament. You need to pay close attention to the depth to which the downward spiral will take you individually. The depth to which the downward spiral of sin will take a culture collectively. Those who deny the truth of God, those who seek to be wise in their own eyes, the Lord will give them over. The Lord will allow them to continue in that which they so desire. No, the Lord chose them not because of their greatness. The Lord chose them not because of their goodness. The Lord chose them not because of their sufficiency, their military right, might, not because of their own righteousness, because of his sovereign choice because of the love that he had for them that emanated from himself, his very being, his oath, his covenant, he had made in himself within the Trinity and with the ancestors of Israel, going back even to the garden. God's love emanates from him. It wasn't because of who you are, it wasn't because of who the Jews were, because of who the Jews would become. The Father elected, the Father called them, the Father chose them. And the same is true with you, dear Christian. The Father has elected you. You have been called. You have been called out. Distinct. You are a church. You are the true Israel. Christ Jesus has died on your behalf. The one who brought all things into existence from absolutely nothing, clothed himself in flesh, and he did two things on your behalf, dear Christian. If you know not Christ, there's two things that you need him to do on your behalf. I will say this. The first thing that he did was he took upon himself the consequences of our sin, that which you deserve for violating the law of God, God is a just judge. God is a better judge than any judge we have on this planet. He is a perfect judge. And he will execute justice perfectly. That fell upon Christ Jesus. The biblical word is propitiation. That fell upon Christ Jesus. We call this the passive obedience of Christ. He took this upon himself. It's what you deserve, dear Christian. He took it upon himself. The second thing he did was what you could not do. You couldn't do either one of them either, actually. But the second thing that he did was he kept the law perfectly in every respect. Not like the lower form of righteousness that man makes. Not like the filthy rags that man tries to bring forward as his righteousness. No, this is perfectly righteous. Christ was obedient from the heart, from the mind, and with the action in every way consistent, never violating the law of God in any way. Christ did that for you, dear Christian. Dear friend, if you know not Christ, this is what you need. 
But you cannot do either of those. You cannot take the wrath of God upon yourself. For when it falls upon you, it will be for eternity. You will never exalt the wrath that is over you, that is over you even now. Those who do not believe, John says at the end of chapter 3, the wrath of God is over them. That is present tense for anyone not believing in Christ. The wrath of God is over you. You that have been saved in Christ Jesus, the spirit then acted upon you. That spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the spirit that is within you, that has opened your eyes, that has made you alive, that has given you life. We must not read past things like this. We must slow down to, 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 to revel upon this, to think about the recipients of this gospel apparel, to think about this aspect, because it's so easy to take that Veggie Tales mentality, to take the mentality of so many children's Bibles and children's books and make it mere moralism. Just be kind, just be nice, just be loving without properly defining what that means and without defining what it is to properly do that. You must be in Christ Jesus. That which you are being called to here, that which you are to put on, dear Christian, you are able to put on because you have put on Christ. Christ's righteousness is around you. You have the Spirit of God. So put on then, Paul says. He's calling you to hear this as something that you are to do because of what you are. This is what you are. You are holy and beloved in Christ Jesus. So this is what you should do. See it that way first. I'm having issues here. I'm sorry. If we could make a transition, I'd like to do that. Paul wants you to see what he's calling you to hear and to hear it as something that you're to do. He's encouraging you to be what you are. Think of this as what the Lord called the Jews to in the Old Testament. He called them to be obedient to him because they had been saved mightily. They had been saved mightily from the hands of Pharaoh. They had been saved mightily out of the hands of slavery, slavery to Egypt. And they were called to walk in obedience because of that, because the Lord had saved them. The Lord had purchased them. They had gone from being a slave to Pharaoh to being a slave to the one true God. And I know your American ears don't like to hear words like that, but that is what has happened. And that is what has happened to you, dear Christian. You have gone from being a slave to sin to being a slave to righteousness. The Lord God is your God. King Jesus is not running. He's not running in an election. He is king. He is sovereign. He has saved you. You must right, right, rightly submit yourself to him because of who he is and what he has done for you. So we see there first in verse 12, the recipients of gospel apparel, those who are called to clothe themselves in this apparel. Secondly, secondly, we see the fabric of gospel Apparel. It says, put on then as God's chosen holy ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Think about uniforms, the existence of uniforms, the existence of conformity in particular groups of people in particular occupations, particular standings in society, particular levels of existence some of you may even say you may be sitting before me right now you're saying you know, I don't have a uniform you know I'm, I'm a programmer I go to work I wear whatever I want I can wear jeans I wear a t-shirt I wear tennis shoes I wear a hoodie I don't have a uniform okay Monday morning show up in a three-piece suit 
wear some dress shoes, walk in there with a top hat and a cane. See how your fellow programmers look at you then. Don't be surprised if your boss begins wondering, does he have a, does he have a date or is he uh, trying to get another job? What's, what's going on here? You see, they're going to look at you as though it's strange because even though there may not be a set of rules that you have to follow as far as your dress, there's an understanding, there's a way in which they're expecting you to dress. And I think that's almost anywhere you go, there is a type of uniform that is expected to be there. You don't notice it because you just become accustomed to it. Even those I remember in high school that would seek to be very anti-establishment in how they would dress themselves. They would go out to um, Goodwill or Salvation Army and they would go and they would dress in construction worker shirts or mechanic shirts and it would say Frank or Charles and of course their name wasn't Frank or Charles and it was kind of a point of um, joking that they had among themselves to kind of dress in this way and they would say we're not like all these others we're not like the preps we're not like the jocks we're not like the you know the we call them kickers but they were like people that dressed more like a cowboy with cowboy boots and cowboy shirts and they'd wear a hat so we're not like them we we we, we don't believe that there should be a set way that you have to dress and they're saying to one of them one time you know but all of you dress in the same way. All of you go to Salvation Army and you buy these mismatched clothes that don't really fit with what you're doing and that ends up being the group that you're in. This is quite a surprise for this gentleman. Said, we all wear different clothes. I said, that's exactly the point. This is kind of your group. You have your own little uniform, your anti-establishment uniform. In fact, so many people began to dress this way when I was in high school. This became such a fad that some of these friends of mine that dressed in this way began to complain that the prices at the thrift stores were grow going up. I used to get the shirt for 25 cents, now it's up to $3. You can't get away from it. The realities of uniforms are there. They may change as the culture changes. I've always been fascinated by looking at pictures that happened back in the Great Depression and you'd see people, regular labor workers, People out of work standing in line to get soup because they had no occupation, they had no way to buy themselves food at that time. Standing there, jacket, tie, dress pants. Incredible. Incredible. It's, things have changed now, and I'm not arguing that there should be a change in how we have to go back to that, but my point is that there was a general way in which people were expected to dress. You see this in royalty. They're expected to dress in certain ways. They're to carry themselves in certain ways. There's to be protocols and how it is that they are to act and what they are to do. Same is true for a Christian. There's a way in which you are called to carry yourself. There's a way in which you should clothe yourself, not in your own righteous actions, not like Adam and Eve seeking to work with their own hands and create for themselves their own standard of righteousness that they're clothing themselves in. No, you're to clothe yourself in Christ Jesus. But you're also here to put on. You're to put something on. And that's what Paul's calling them to here. See, Paul, the Lord didn't really just go up to Adam and Eve. And I know we don't have the narrative there saying this, but it's very clear that before they put on the garments that the Lord gave them, before they put them on, they removed the works of their hands. They removed the fig leaves that they had created into some kind of garment, whatever it was. They didn't, they didn't keep that. That was removed. But the Lord didn't just come to them and say, this is ridiculous. What are you doing? Why would you do this? You know how ridiculous this is? No, he, he gave them something else. It wasn't just about putting off. So many times, that, that's where this can fall into. Paul has this theme in Colossians and Ephesians, and it places in Romans this idea of putting off, this idea of putting on. It's not about just not doing things. We talked about things that you're not supposed to do. There's absolutely things, there's activities, there's sinful patterns of behavior that you should not be involved in as a Christian. That is very clear. There's, there's no question about that. But it's not about just not doing things. 
It's not about having a list of things that I'm just not going to do this, and I don't do this, and I don't do this, and I don't do this. Okay. That has to be filled with something. There's something that needs to be in its place. And just as the Lord granted to them, gave to Adam and Eve something else that they were to put on, you are to put off these works of unrighteousness. You're to put off these, these worldly aspects, but you're to put on certain things. Just as we see, see in the Ten Commandments, you have negative commands, right? We, we, just, we just had one today. The Eighth Commandment is you shall not steal, right? That's the Eighth Commandment. That's what you should do. So I fulfill the Eighth Commandment by just never taking anything that belongs to anyone else. No, we, we talked about it today in the catechism question. The lawful procuring and furthering the wealth and outward of state of ourselves and others. Now that's a little different than just not stealing, isn't it? There's a slight difference there. See, instead of just, instead, it's the very opposite if you think about it. When I go and I steal something, okay, I, I, I'm taking away value. I, I, I'm making things less valuable in some way for someone else. Possibly in some way for myself. There's consequences to stealing. There's consequences under the law. Rightly so. There's ways in which stealing is sanctioned in our culture and others. But that's another topic for another time. But the Eighth Commandment here says, it says it's procuring and furthering the wealth and outward of state of ourselves and others. And Paul talks about this. Paul says, let someone no longer steal, but rather be useful with your hands. Be fruitful. Be productive. It's not about just not taking someone else's stuff. It is about working in a way that glorifies God. It's about taking the resources the Lord has given you and using them to be a blessing to yourself, your family, and those around you. It's not just about, did I take someone's stuff or not? You have to move yourself away from just making this line of just the negative aspect of it. You're called there to put on something. You're called there to do something. So it is here. Paul is calling those who have been saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus Paul is calling those here, these chosen ones, beloved in Christ Jesus, he's calling them, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. Look at the first one, compassionate hearts, kindness, putting that uh, not just did I not do this, but where is the heart from which your actions are coming from? The Lord desires your heart. The Lord desires for you, dear Christian, to be obedient even from your heart. And I can't help but think of the many, many times that we see the compassionate heart of Christ Jesus. When, when I read through these, these, these commands that we see here, I think of Christ in the many ways in which Christ was doing these himself, how he has set an example whereby we can see even what this looks like. Matthew 9 and verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He saw these people. He had compassion on them. He saw their estate. He saw where they were. Again, Matthew 14, 14, Jesus saw the huge crowd and he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Remember, these are times in which Jesus was tired. Jesus wanted to get away from the crowds. He didn't want to be by the crowds. He, he would go away and they would continue to flock after him and follow after him. And he had a compassionate heart toward them. Matthew 15 and verse 32, Jesus calls his disciples and said, I feel sorry for these people. They have been here with me for three days and they have nothing left to eat. I don't want to send them away hungry or they will faint along the way. He had compassion for them, even in the physical uh, demands that were on them, even in the consequences of the hunger that was on them. And this is knowing that some of these people end up later chasing after him, desiring nothing more than him just to be someone who makes food for them not desiring to submit to him as the king of the universe, as one who would save them from their sins. 
help but think of John chapter 11. You see the compassion of Jesus there. You see the heart of Christ there for this people as they see him incorrectly. You see the heart of Christ for his friends, seeing the sorrow of his dear friends, seeing the sorrow that they have because of a friend of Christ was even his life was lost. John 11 and verse 34, I'll begin in verse 32. It says, when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus, when he saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus, still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. And we have Jesus here standing before this time. And there is a, he is moved at this time because they, they are not seeing him as who he is. They're not seeing him as being the Messiah. They're not seeing their greater need here to be, to be saved in Christ Jesus. Not seeing Jesus for who he is and what he came to do. Humility, meekness, put on humility and meekness. So, so many times, so many times a, a man is driven into sin, a man is driven into pride because of his own personal greatness. He thinks high of himself. He thinks high of his own personal intellect and he looks down on other people well, these people aren't as intelligent as I am. These people aren't as wise as I am. These people aren't as sophisticated as I am. To think of those and compare them to Christ Jesus. Who is more wise? You or Christ? Regardless of your intelligence, regardless of your wealth, regardless of your, your power, Christ Jesus is all-knowing. Christ Jesus is, is all-powerful. Christ Jesus is, is sovereign. You revel in your own sophistication and your ability to creatively work within this particular culture. Jesus made that which you're using. You're merely using that which he made. And I say this to say, not to put people in their place or to say this is where you are, but to think of it this way. What does it say for a man who would revel in his own intelligence, revel in his own financial standing, revel in his own power, when you have the Lord Jesus Christ who humbled himself, humbled himself, clothed himself in flesh, walked as a man, suffered as a man, took upon himself the consequences of our sin. And yet was he not the humblest man who ever walked? If there was someone who could have a right to be prideful and to make much of himself, to make much of his own power, one who could have called down angels to save him from the cross, but humbled himself, showed love to us, and while we were yet sinners, the joy set before him died upon the cross, was faithful even there. The ways you see humility in Christ Jesus, the ways in which Christ desires for you to walk in that same way. Not reveling in who you are. But we need to check ourselves. That's, that's why being in the word is so important. That's why sitting under the preached word is so important. That's why looking to the word and remembering what it is the Lord has done for you is so important. If, if nothing should put a check on your pride, it should be the fact that Christ was humble if you would look down on someone else, think much of your own righteousness, your own good deeds, at least I'm not like this person, the pride. At least I don't do this. At least I'm not like this. Could Christ Jesus not have done that? Would he not have a right to look to you in that way, but yet he does not do that to you, dear Christian? He is compassionate towards you. He is humble towards you. He thought of your best and not his own personal comfort. So 
Jesus could make that argument, and he did not. Jesus walked and lived his life as a humble man. He was perfectly righteous. He never sinned. Jesus is the one that brought all things into existence. Jesus was humble in all, all ways. Consider these realities, dear friends. There, there's no excuse that any of us would ever have to be prideful. There's no excuse that any of us would have to, to make much of ourselves or to revel in our own greatness. Patience. All the ways. The ways the Lord Christ Jesus has shown patience toward us. Think even about the Jews in the Old Testament. The ways in which God would have been justified right to immediately remove them. But he showed patience with them. Showed patience even with the Canaanites who ended up being removed from the land. There was a point at which their sins had reached a level to which they were going to be removed. But he was patient until then. Oh, the Lord Jesus Christ has been patient with you. He has been patient with me. That is what Paul's calling us to. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Put on then compassionate hearts and kindness and humility and meekness and patience. Put this on. Take off these things of old. Take off the pride. Take off the worldliness and put on the righteousness of Christ walk forward in righteous action because of what the Lord Christ Jesus has done for you. So we have here the recipients of gospel apparel. Those are those that have been called in Christ Jesus. Those are those who are in Christ Jesus. Those that are holy and beloved. Those that are chosen. We see the, the fabric of this gospel apparel, this compassionate hearts and kindness and humility and meekness and patience. Thirdly, we see the ramifications of this gospel apparel, the consequences of someone putting on this gospel apparel, putting off these works of unrighteousness, putting off this worldliness, putting on these good deeds. It says in verse 13, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. These are traits that are especially helpful, as you see here, when you are offended, when someone has offended you, when you feel that someone has wronged you in some way. See, when you're, when you're bearing with yourself, you're bearing that anger, that wrath, that malice, that slander, you're bearing these things, it's going to affect how it is that you respond to someone else. You have a wrong perspective at that time. Your eyes aren't upon Christ. Your eyes aren't upon remembering who you are. Your eyes are not upon remembering that you are holy and beloved, that you are chosen in Christ Jesus, that you've been granted new life, that you've been granted true righteousness in Christ Jesus. Your eyes are not upon that. Your eyes are upon that which is worldly, and it has ramifications. It has an effect upon you. You are forgetting what the Lord has done for you. And it's influencing how it is that you're acting toward one another. And you'll especially see it when you have a complaint against another. It results in an unforgiving spirit. You're forgetting. Notice what Paul says there. Forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Think of the ways that this affects you and how you should be forgiving towards others. Think of the ways in which you should remember when you're wronged against, the ways in which you have wronged even greater against the Lord. Someone sins against you, you're a sinful man, and they may have sinned against you in very, very great ways. Great and incredible ways. Ways that may even affect you throughout the rest of your earthly life, may even affect people in generations to come with the significance of the seriousness of the sin that they have committed. But when you compare that to what you have done even to the Lord, that you are the reason, you are the one 
that sinned against a perfectly righteous and holy God. There is no greater act of injustice that ever occurred than Christ dying upon the cross. It was the greatest act that ever occurred, but through that act, the greatest act of redemption came forward. And if the Lord would be forgiving to us, what standing do we have to lack in forgiveness to someone else? On what basis can we make such an argument for our rightness in such a circumstance? This is many times read at weddings. It's a very common passage to read at weddings. In fact, we're going to uh, be getting to interactions between husbands and wives and fathers and children and slaves and masters here very shortly. And so what Paul's saying here is going to be influential in these areas, but this is something very especially. You have this bearing one with another, this forgiveness that is required and necessary there within the familial unit, there between um, bosses and employees, there between parents and children, that is something that is a reality. And the what it is that you're trusting is going to manifest itself for you there within your life, within the family, within your job, between husband and wife, and between parents and children and children and parents. He's telling them here, if one has a complaint against someone, absolutely bring it to them. But forgiveness must be something that is a result of what the Lord has done for you. You're someone who has put on. You're someone who has been changed. You're someone who has put on kindness and humility and meekness and the ways in which this is going to affect you. Ephesians 4 and verse 32, Paul says, Indeed, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Again, going back to that same emphasis, the Lord has forgiven you, therefore you should be forgiving to others. The Lord has been kind to you, you should be kind to others. The Lord has been humble towards you. You should be humble toward others. Each of these things we can look back and see. Christ has done this towards me. Christ has demonstrated this in his life. How much more should I be doing this towards other people? I was not deserving of what Christ did to me. How much more should I be obedient to Christ who is deserving of my righteous obedience? I want us to... Uh, Think of the illustration that Jesus gave in Luke chapter 7 regarding the woman who um, was grateful for her forgiveness and one who was grateful for the forgiveness that Christ had given to her. It starts in verse 39, and it says, When the Pharisee had invited him, he saw this. He said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of a woman was touching him. She's a sinner. And you see you see the perspective of these Jewish leaders at this point, looking down upon her, thinking high of, of, uh, regarding their own standing, looking at her and saying, how could you be around someone like this? The pride, you can almost hear it there in their emphasis. She is a sinner. Then Jesus answered his, his thoughts. I love that. Jesus answered his, his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him a story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other, but neither could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust off from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time that I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven, so she has shown much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And the men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And you see this very real um, 
interaction there between these Jewish leaders that thought very high of themselves and looked low upon this woman, and they were not seeing the reality of their sin. They were almost seeing her as someone who was, who was put off, who is unclean, who needs to be put away, not seeing her as one who needs salvation in the Messiah who was to come, but most especially not seeing the ways in which they had fallen short of the law of God. Oh, dear friends, see this reality. Being, being a forgiving person is a consequence of being forgiven. Being a forgiving person is a consequence of being forgiven. There is a degree to which you will display these as a Christian. You will be someone who is putting these things on. You have put on Christ Jesus. You are someone who is loved. You are someone who is beloved in Christ. You are someone who is chosen by God. And there will be ways in which this affects you. uh, Jesus says this in Matthew 6, beginning in 14. If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will the Father forgive you your trespasses. And he's saying this here not as you will get forgiven because you forgave someone else. You've got to understand what the word for there means within this context. It means rather because this is something that is going to happen because of what the Lord has done in you. You're going to be someone who is going to forgive. It's something you're going to grow in throughout your Christian life. These are things that you're going to continue to put on throughout your Christian life. You're going to see the ways in which you're falling short in these areas in your Christian life. But when you see the ways in which you're falling short, it should drive you to cling greater and greater upon the cross. That is the importance of the preaching of the law of God. So many times when the law of God is preached to people, they look at that and they say, well, this is just legalistic. You preach the highness of the law of God. You talk about the law of God as Jesus talked about it when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. And he's putting forward before the people there something that nobody can say, I got that. I'm good there. I have no, I don't really need to improve in that area. No, he's putting it before you as something that you're absolutely not keeping. Every idle thought will be judged, dear friend. But the importance of putting the law out as it is and the importance of the preaching of the word of God so that people can hear the manifest ways in which they're falling short of the law of God is so that they can see the ways in which they should rightly respond to the Lord in trusting even more in the risen Lord Christ Jesus, trusting even more in his finished work and trusting even more to walk in obedience in what he has done, desiring to continue to repent. The preaching of the law is important. You see, it is when the law is not preached that you have legalism. You may say, well, how can you say that? How can you say that when the law is not preached rightly, when there's not an emphasis upon the law, that it it results in legalism? Because that's the reality. Legalism is where man seeks to fulfill God's law through his own actions. Man seeks to raise his standing with the Lord by fulfilling what the law says. See, you have to be an ignorant man to think that you can do that. You have to be a foolish person to think that you can fulfill the law through your own actions, having a right heart, having a right thought, having even the proper desires. No, we fall short in these areas, then we must continue to trust in the Lord. But the preaching of the law rightly brings the Christian to a greater knowledge brings them to a greater knowledge of the ways in which they are falling short and brings them to a greater love of the Savior that has redeemed them, has saved them. That is the picture that you have here with this woman and the ways in which this flows, and this flows out of a heart of humility. There's no, there's no greater way to humble yourself than to see the ways in which you sinned against God, than to see the ways in which you're rightly deserving the wrath and curse of God, but he has shown kindness to you. He has shown love to you through the Lord Christ Jesus. And that is who you are, the recipients of the gospel apparel. We saw the fabric of the gospel apparel, that which you're putting on, the effects of the gospel apparel. Fourthly, 
Well, I almost didn't have a fourth point, but Paul seems to have this as, as something that I think needs to be a point in and of itself. This thread that binds the gospel apparel. Verse 14, and above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. This is what he says, above all, even before you've put on these other things, that which is of greater importance, that which is going to bind all things together, that's which is going to hold all things together in perfect harmony, put on love. This is a reminder of the great commandment that Jesus spoke of. Notice that he didn't talk primarily about what you're doing. He didn't say, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. He's calling a person to love first and foremost. And this is what I think we need to take away from this. And this emphasis on love that binds the fabric of this garment together, that holds everything together in such perfect harmony. And that is that you can do these things. You can outwardly do certain actions, but it cannot flow from a heart of love. It cannot flow from a heart of doing what is best for this other person, doing what, acting in a way that rightly glorifies the Lord. See, when you're dealing with something in a loving way, it may not be, it may not seem loving to the person that you're speaking to at the time. Someone that hates truth may think that truth is hateful, all right? Someone who, who hates truth may not interpret what you're doing as loving. Jesus spoke truth. Jesus was always loving. Jesus was being loving when he was flipping over tables. I'm not telling you to go flip over tables. But Jesus was being loving when he spoke harshly to the Jewish leaders. Jewish, Jesus was being loving when he showed mercy and kindness to other people. Jesus was always loving. It doesn't matter what he did. It was always loving. It always flowed from a heart of love and compassion toward the other people out of a love toward God, speaking what is best to the other people. But that's a key in understanding actions. It's a key in understanding how it is that we are acting one toward another because you can do a right deed and it can still be sinful. Paul says that. Whatever is not done in faith is sin. Maybe frightful for somebody. Some of you say, well, where do I go from here? So you're telling me I could have done the right thing. I can go and risk my life to save someone and you can tell me it's still sinful? Well, what if I just killed them? Well, that would be more sinful. Okay, so don't do that. But what you, what you need to see is that even the greatness of your risking your life to save someone else, even the goodness of that is something that falls short of the holy standard of God's law if it's not done from a heart of love, if it's not done from a heart of faith, if it's not done with the desire to glorify God. And this is something that has been no small controversy for us, even in the past, this has been something that has been no small controversy for other people as well. And I think this is something that is especially important. I would say this is especially important for you as parents in raising children. You need to see your children as someone you are evangelizing, someone you are sharing the good news of the gospel with, and someone you're also discipling, someone that you're raising up. You're teaching them to do certain things. Our children, we teach them to pray even at an early age. They don't know what they're saying many times. They're repeating whatever it is that we're saying. And someone could go and they could criticize that. You're saying, you're, you're just teaching them to be Pharisees. You're just teaching them to stand on their own good works. God doesn't receive that prayer from them. I would argue this to you. No, it is sinful to pray a prayer to God and to pray the prayer from the wrong heart. But it's even more sinful not to pray to God at all. The same thing has come up at other times. Should you tell a child to say thank you? Should you tell a child to say, I'm sorry? You absolutely should. But what if they don't have the right heart? What if their heart's not behind it? That's sinful. That's wrong. But I'm telling them to sin. Yeah, but if you don't teach them to be a thankful person, you're teaching them to sin even more than if they said thank you and they didn't really mean it. 
So you must teach both. You must teach people to do the right actions, but you must also be teaching your children that their heart is corrupt, their heart is damaged, and they need Jesus. They need to be changed. And that's what Paul is doing here as well. He is binding this together. He is saying this, this harmony that exists here, what, what holds together this, this gospel apparel is love. Having a love one for another, having a love for God. Above all, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So even before you've done these activities, you've put on these certain things which have these particular results, the heart from which this flows needs to be that of love. And it's that love that Christ Jesus demonstrated for his people. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That you could be, dear friend, that you could be a recipient of this gospel apparel. That you could be one who is holy and beloved and chosen in Christ Jesus. Not one who is manufacturing a righteousness of your own, a goodness of your own. One that is as filthy rags. One that is of no good at all. One is, that, is, that, is, that is decrepit. One that is good to be thrown in the trash. But rather, putting on Christ Jesus, Christ's righteousness, Christ's goodness. And all the ways that should affect you, you should then be putting on these good works that, that we have spoken of, resulting, coming from a heart which is humble, meekness and kindness, resulting in one who is forgiving towards others. And why? Why, dear friends, because you're one who has been forgiven in Christ Jesus, but most of all, bound together in love, and that love that has been shown to us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died on our behalf. Oh, that that would bring harmony to our lives and our actions, and undergird all that we do, that we would remember who we are in Christ Jesus and where we would be apart from his gracious.